The following presentation is brought to you by Discovery Education, leading the world of digital and video learning. Discovery Education, connect to a world of learning. Hold on to your flags because Assignment Discovery is battling the British in American History, Road to Revolution. First, we'll examine the laws that stirred rebellion in the American colonies in the price of independence. Then we'll diagnose the causes and effects of one of our nation's great tragedies in Boston Massacre, Facts and Fiction. Next, we'll learn about the hardship and heroism of soldiers in Colonial Americans at War. Finally, we'll set our sights on understanding the tactics used by American soldiers in the Revolutionary War, Rebels and Redcoats. America's March to Freedom, coming up next. As you watch the first half of this program, keep these questions in mind. Why did the British need to tax the colonies? What were the effects of Samuel Adams calling the event in Boston a massacre? The American colonies had grown used to being governed from across the Atlantic Ocean, but Britain's grip wasn't loosening. British taxes and soldiers were a constant reminder that the king was still in control colonists were angry and they were ready to act. What do you know about the leaders of the American Revolution and their beliefs? Madison, Hamilton, Monroe. John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin. George Washington was the leader of the army. They were fighting against taxes from Britain, especially unfair ones that they thought they shouldn't have to pay because they weren't represented. The leaders of the American Revolution based their philosophy on John Locke who said that the government exists purely to work for the needs of the people. And so it was a real way for them to say, this is what we believe in and we want our freedom and we're going to do what it takes to get it. After 1500, many European nations were competing for land in North America. The French and British already controlled vast territories but both nations were interested in owning even more. With help from the Iroquois, British troops and colonists defeated the French in the French and Indian War. Colonists were grateful to the British government for sending soldiers, but they wanted to remain as free as possible of control by the mother country. For that reason, the end of the war brought new friction between the colonists and Britain. First, Britain's King George III issued the Proclamation of 1763. In it, the king forbade colonists from moving west of the Appalachian Mountains. The British wanted to prevent the colonists from taking more land from Native Americans because they feared it would lead to more expensive wars. And the British decided that the colonists should help pay the cost of the soldiers they would station in America, soldiers who protected the colonists from Native American attacks. In 1765, Britain passed the Stamp Act, which placed a tax on all printed material, from newspapers to playing cards. Calling themselves the Sons of Liberty, many colonists took to the streets to protest the new taxes. Eventually, the colonists' actions forced Britain to repeal the Stamp Act, but the British put new taxes in place. Each time the British passed a new tax, the colonists became angry colonists staged boycotts of British goods and they wrote pamphlets that criticized Parliament's policies. Tensions rose even more when the British sent troops to restore order. Anger would soon turn to violence in Boston. On March 5, 1770, an angry group of colonists surrounded a small group of British soldiers. They threw snowballs and rocks. The frightened soldiers opened fire, killing five colonists and wounding six. This event came to be called the Boston Massacre. Three years later, the British passed the Tea Act, which aimed to help a British tea company. 
Again, the colonists boycotted. And on the night of December 16, 1773, the Sons of Liberty took a further step. A group of men disguised as Native Americans boarded an English ship that was docked in Boston. Then they dumped 342 cases of tea into the harbor. The king was furious with the colonists and parliament passed a set of laws called the Coercive Acts. The colonists called them the Intolerable Acts because they were so severe. The Intolerable Acts closed Boston's port, reduced the power of town meetings and increased the authority of British royal officials. The king had hoped the colonists would give in to his power. Instead, they continued to resist. Delegates from many colonies met in the First Continental Congress in the fall of 1774. They demanded that Britain remove the intolerable acts, but the British refused. The next spring, the British sent troops to the town of Concord to seize a supply of weapons. On the way to Concord, the British soldiers met 70 militiamen in the town of Lexington. A shot was fired, the first shot of the American Revolution. More shots rang out and eight colonists died. The British continued to Concord, but met more militia and more fighting. They were forced to retreat. Militia troops from nearby towns fired on the British during the long retreat to Boston, killing and wounding many soldiers. In May 1775, the Second Continental Congress met in Philadelphia to discuss what to do. Some delegates wanted to remain loyal to Britain, others wanted independence, and others were undecided but most knew war was on the horizon. Meanwhile, British troops and militiamen faced each other again in a battle at Bunker Hill near Boston. For a while, the colonists held off their enemy, but the British took the hill on their third try. The militia lost the battle, but proved that they could stand up to the well-trained British army. This confidence would help spur a war for independence. Did you know there were two Boston Tea Parties? After the success of the first one, Bostonians held a second one on March 7, 1774. The loss of tea cost the British government the equivalent of $3 million in today's currency. Colonists were angered by the presence of British soldiers in the colonies, especially in Boston. One fateful night, a group of redcoats would be tested by an irate mob of colonists. No one knows exactly what started the confrontation, but the outcome is certain. Samuel Adams took control and made sure colonists knew that blood had been spilled. What are the qualities of a good leader? Loving but firm. They have to have confidence. Somebody who also is just very strong emotionally. Daring, compassionate. Bold, gracious, noble. They should be fair and honest and they should do the right thing. Smart, dependable. Wise. Always do the right thing. He knows what's good for the people and make decisions based on that. In the middle of the 1700s, Great Britain had 13 colonies along the Atlantic coast of North America. The colonists who lived there enjoyed what seemed like an unlimited supply of cheap land. They were proud to be a part of Britain and proud of the rights they enjoyed as British subjects. But trouble began in 1763 when the British government banned the colonists from settling farther west. Overnight, the colonists were denied precious new land and with it, opportunity. Many ignored the proclamation and continued to settle in those forbidden lands. But they could not ignore the next action the British took, the Stamp Act of 1765. The Stamp Act required that every piece of paper sold in the colonies, from pamphlets to playing cards, have a revenue stamp. The colonists complained that the British had never imposed such a tax on Americans before. Angry colonists boycotted British goods. Some even rioted in protest. As the riots and boycotts continued, the British were forced to give in. Less than a year after the Stamp Act came into effect, the British Parliament repealed the tax law. But Parliament soon approved other duties and taxes, and tensions mounted in the colonies. Britain sent troops to Boston to maintain order and enforce its taxes. 
On March 5, 1770, an angry mob in Boston gathered around nine British soldiers, or redcoats. The crowd began to taunt them and threaten them with wooden clubs and sticks. When their shouts did not provoke the soldiers, the crowd threw ice at them, and some in the crowd even yelled fire. When a colonist named Richard Palm struck a soldier with a club, a shot finally rang out. Other shots quickly followed. Some witnesses later claimed that Captain Thomas Preston, the commander of the British troops, ordered his soldiers to fire. Others said the soldiers fired their weapons on their own. The soldiers themselves said their shooting was in self-defense. When the smoke cleared, five colonists lay dead or dying. Samuel Adams, one of the leaders of the anti-British protests, saw an opportunity in this tragedy. He and his allies began calling the incident the Boston Massacre. They helped rouse further anger against the British with articles and pictures that described British soldiers shooting at unarmed civilians. The British tried to calm the colonists by bringing the soldiers to trial. In the end, juries made up of colonists ruled that Preston and most of his men had fired in self-defense. Only two of Preston's soldiers were convicted, but they were only found guilty of manslaughter. The trials helped calm American anger. Parliament also tried to appease the colonies by repealing all the duties it had enacted, except one. England would not overturn the tax on tea. Within a few years, this tax added to the colonists' growing resentment toward the British, and conflict erupted again, first along the docks of Boston, and then across the colonies. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. Why did the British need to tax the colonies? What were the effects of Samuel Adams calling the event in Boston a massacre? If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. As you watch the second half of this program, keep these questions in mind. How did George Washington's leadership help the colonists win the Revolutionary War? How were the rebel tactics different from what the British had faced before? The rebel colonists were going up against one of the most dominating armies in the world, and they knew the Redcoats would not be forgiving. To succeed, they needed a leader who would help them face the British head on. George Washington was their answer. What makes someone a hero? Superpowers. Someone who puts um, other people before themselves. Someone who's brave. They must have a strong character. Strong, like mentally and physically. Someone that um, other people can look up to. Somebody who cares for other people without getting something back. Just someone who can make a difference in someone's life. It does good in the world. Someone who saves someone's life. Not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. By 1776, fighting between American colonists and British troops had already taken place. But Americans were divided over the dispute with Britain. Some colonists, called patriots, wanted complete independence from Britain. Others, known as loyalists, supported the British government and considered the patriots to be traitors and many colonists had no strong feelings either way. However, public opinion began to shift with the publication of a pamphlet called Common Sense. In its 50 or so pages, author Thomas Paine criticized the idea of being ruled by a British monarch. Paine called on colonists to fight for American independence. The sun never shined on a cause of greater worth. Tis not the concern of a day, a year, or an age. Posterity will be affected, even to the end of time. 
Paine's words inspired widespread support for the revolution. In July of 1776, the Continental Congress took a first step toward breaking away from Britain. The delegates voted to break with Britain. Then they approved the Declaration of Independence, which stated the reasons for independence. The document represented the commitment of the 13 colonies to continue the war against Britain until victory was achieved. But a long fight lay ahead to make independence a reality. George Washington led the American troops, who were known as the Continental Army. At first, the Continental Army suffered several defeats and had to retreat from New York. But on Christmas night, 1776, Washington led 2,400 men across the icy Delaware River, surprising the British and gaining a victory. The real turning point came in the fall of 1777 at the Battle of Saratoga. There, the Americans forced a large British army to surrender. France, which wanted to weaken Britain, realized that America had a real chance of winning the war. It signed a treaty of alliance with the United States and sent soldiers and ships to help the Americans. But struggles remained. Washington and his army suffered a cruel winter in 1777 and 1778 in its camp at Valley Forge. The 11,000 Continental soldiers were hungry and cold and wore threadbare clothes. Many were sick with chills, fever, diarrhea, or worse, and provisions were scarce. Men without clothes to cover their nakedness, without blankets to lay on, without shoes. Their marches might be traced by the blood from their feet marching through frost and snow. Despite their hardships, Washington's troops used this period to train and become a more effective army. At the end of 1778, the British shifted their attention toward the South. Within weeks, Britain controlled South Carolina and set its sights on North Carolina. But Patriot fortunes improved as the Continental Army staged a comeback in the South. The final major battle took place in October 1781 at Yorktown, Virginia. American and French forces trapped a British army and left it only one option, surrender. A number of factors contributed to the American victory. Even the British would come to admit that George Washington's skilled leadership helped secure victory for the colonists. In addition, the French certainly helped the Americans defeat their enemy. Also, the British faced a difficult task. America was a large land, and they did not have the forces to control all of it. Finally, American victory would not have been possible without the patriotic spirit and passionate commitment of the soldiers. They were not prepared to give up, even though they bore great hardships. After the defeat at Yorktown, the British Parliament voted in favor of peace and negotiations with the Americans began in 1782. In 1783, British and American officials signed the Treaty of Paris. With that act, Britain granted the independence of its one-time colonies. A new nation, the United States, was born. Did you know President Jimmy Carter felt that George Washington's role as first president and commander of the Continental Army deserved greater recognition. So Carter gave Washington a posthumous promotion to a six-star general. The British forces were comprised of professional soldiers, and the rebels had great leaders who are remembered today, but farmers, blacksmiths, writers, fathers and sons, and many other ordinary men became heroes when they sacrificed their lives for freedom. Who is your hero? I'd have to say that my hero is Steve McQueen. My passion because he's given me so much insight on how to live life. The Indigo Girls, pretty much because they're total babes. My hero would be Lance Armstrong uh, through his fight through cancer and then still being able to win back-to-back -to -back Tour de France. I would say my mom's my hero. My mother is my hero because of the wonderful value she has instilled in me. I think Gandhi is one man who has affected many lives. Lisa Simpson. Nicole Kidman. The man who stood in front of a line of tanks in Tiananmen Square. Martin Luther King Jr. because of all he's done for America and like the changes he made and the amount of people who followed him. My dad is my hero. Ever since I was little, my dad was the one who you know, taught me how to play sports. I think he's doing pretty well, and I want to just follow in his footsteps.
We have the power to begin the world again. A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. The birthday of a new world is at hand. Thomas Paine, 1775 The new world that Thomas Paine heralded was America, a nation born of revolution. The war began with a single shot fired in a small New England village and ended eight years later on the other side of the world. It would be waged from the Great Lakes to the Caribbean Sea, from the West Indies to India. Forty million people on four continents would become embroiled in this colonial rebellion. And within the colonies, Americans would bitterly fight their first civil war. For nine generations, the settlers of this vast frontier had considered themselves loyal British Americans. But foremost, they were Virginians. They were New Yorkers. They were Pennsylvanians. Residents of 13 separate colonies stretched along the fringe of an untamed continent. In a time when it took two months to cross the Atlantic, they enjoyed the freedom of being governed from 3,000 miles away. On the night of April 18, 1775, the question of who would rule America was about to resound in gunfire. From Boston, the commander of the British forces in America, General Thomas Gage, dispatched 800 redcoats to the town of Concord to snuff out this insurrection before it could begin. Having received intelligence that ammunition, artillery, and small arms have been collected for the avowed purpose of raising a rebellion against His Majesty, you will march to Concord, where you will seize and destroy all military stores, whatever. Before the order reached British soldiers, it was passed to American spies, who set in motion an elaborate series of alarms to warn the countryside. Shortly after 10 p.m., two lanterns glowed briefly in the steeple of Boston's Old North Church, just long enough to signal patriots across the Charles River that the Redcoats would move that night by water. The official courier of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, a 40-year-old silversmith named Paul Revere, received urgent orders from Joseph Warren, the head of rebel intelligence. About 10 o'clock, Dr. Warren begged that I would immediately set off for Lexington. Two friends rode me across the Childs River. They landed me on the Childstown side, went on to the town, and there got a horse. The moon shone bright. Around midnight, Revere reached the small town of Lexington and shouted, the regulars are coming. Paul Revere didn't say the British are coming because the colonists regarded themselves as British. Uh, they were British citizens who lived in America, but they were certainly British citizens. So Revere and the other dispatch riders said the regulars are coming or the redcoats are coming. The town bell rang and for as far as it could be heard, young men and old pulled on their boots and headed for the village green. In the chill night, 130 militiamen stood at the ready for an hour. But it seemed the alarm might be false. Captain John Parker had sent scouts to locate the Redcoats, but not one had returned. Parker released the men to wait for the next call of the drum. 
Up to 30 withdrew to nearby Buckman Tavern. There's always a sort of a loaded situation when you're sitting in a tavern all night. I'm not sure at Buckman Tavern they felt the night of April 18th that they were uh, going to have a, a major war on their hands. I think they were intent on showing the British that they were serious. Out on the road, the regulars were being driven hard, a mile every 16 minutes. Their officers feared daybreak and detection. Inside some of the houses they passed, men and women were wide awake, melting pewter dishes into musket balls. Inside Buckman Tavern, all was quiet. At about 4.30, a scout returned with news. The Redcoats were indeed coming. They were less than half a mile down the road. Three British companies, about a hundred men, reached a crossroad. A hot-blooded young lieutenant had to choose between taking his men toward Concord, where he had been told to go, or into Lexington, where he could see armed Americans waiting. With his superiors out of earshot, Lieutenant Jesse Adair made his fateful choice. At five o'clock on the morning of April 19th, he led his men toward Lexington Green. Captain Parker gathered his men, now fewer than 80, and gave his orders. Stand your ground. Don't fire unless fired upon. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. No one knew what would happen when the two forces collided. And certainly no colonial uh, commander wanted to give the order to fire. If they fired on British regulars, they could be tried for treason. The militia heard British Major John Pitcairn yell, lay down your arms, and another officer shout, ye rebels disperse, damn you, disperse. Outnumbered, Captain Parker told his men to abandon the green. Then, from somewhere, a shot rang out. There is no saying who fired it, rebel or redcoat. But in that puff of smoke, the bond of kinship between England and America was severed. This is a revolutionary situation in which literally everything changes, not merely in the course of a single day, but almost in the course of a single minute. Long as it takes to fire the guns and the soldiers drop dead, everything has changed. In the chaos, the British charged forward, blindly thrusting their bayonets and ignoring their officers' shouts to fall in. At last, the drums brought the Redcoats back into ranks, and their officers marched them the way they were supposed to have gone in the first place, toward Concord. The British took stock and found they had only one man wounded, a private shot in the thigh. For the families in Lexington, the toll was unthinkable. Eight men lay dead. Nine more were wounded. Among the survivors, shock gave way to rage. They shouldered their muskets and set off toward Concord to vent their grief in British blood. Paul Revere never finished his midnight ride. Just after 1 a.m., he was captured by a British patrol. But the alarm was carried to Concord by a local physician, Samuel Prescott, who had been recruited by Revere less than an hour earlier. As day broke on April 19th, virtually every town within 20 miles had been alerted that the Redcoats were coming.
By 8 a.m., the British reached Concord to search for rebel arms. All they could find were three cannons, 60 casks of flour, and 500 pounds of musket balls. A mile and a half north of Concord, about a hundred redcoats were holding a small bridge. On a hill above them, 400 angry militiamen gathered and waited. The Concord militia was being steadily reinforced by men from neighboring Acton, Bedford, Carlisle. Yet they made no move until they saw smoke billowing over the town. The British were burning the few armaments they had found, but the militiamen assumed it was their homes. They advanced on the North Bridge. Minuteman Amos Barrett reported he was within 15 rods of the Redcoats, about 80 yards, when they opened fire. They fired three guns, one after the other. I see the balls striking the river on the right of me. Their balls whistled well. Militia Major John Buttrick shouted, Fire, fellow soldiers, for God's sake, fire! In the exchange, two militiamen were killed. Four of eight British officers were wounded. Three enlisted men fell dead. And the King's troops fell back. Fleeing toward Concord, they rejoined the commander of their expedition, Lieutenant Colonel Francis Smith. Smith had been expecting a relief column, but it was hours overdue. He finally began what he called a strategic withdrawal back towards Boston. To the Americans, it looked like a retreat, and it looked like an opportunity. Using a shortcut, the militia reached a crossing called Merriam's Corner ahead of the King's troops. Taking cover behind houses, fences, and trees, they waited for their quarry to march into their trap. Before we'd gone half a mile, we were fired on from all sides. The country was full of woods, which the rebels did not fail to take advantage of. But they were all lined with people who kept an incessant fire upon us. Their numbers increasing from all parts while ours was reduced by deaths, wounds, and fatigue. Lieutenant John Barker. The British thought that the Americans' tactics were pretty shameful. Uh, many British participants complained bitterly at the way in which the Americans had from behind cover shot at them on the road. They found this very difficult to cope with. They were not used to this guerrilla type of warfare. Exhausted and out of ammunition, the Redcoats finally saw their salvation. Lord Hugh Percy's relief column of a thousand men arrived. Smith's men took an hour's rest under the protection of Percy's cannon. Then they resumed their retreat. As many as 3,000 rebels now lined the road. The British faced a 15-mile gauntlet back to Boston, maintaining their formations under a withering fire. It became the great myth that the British were stupid and standing there getting shot at. They really didn't have any other choice. I mean, once they were on the road and they were out there, they had to get back in some kind of order. The minute they all spread to the four winds, they'd be in individual targets. A little bit harder to find, but you'd lose all of your military capacity if you did that. So that was the only tactical choice that they could make. At sundown, the Redcoats finally reached safety near Boston. More than 270 men 
nearly one in six were wounded, missing, or dead. It was really a rural riot is what it was. Everybody came and took a shot, you know, and uh, all day long this was escalating and escalating. When the British finally got back, practically destroyed, uh, the country could never be the same again. After the clash at Lexington on April 19th, express riders rushed from one New England village to another, shouting the news that the King's troops had spilled colonial blood. Within a day, 20,000 men responded. When news of the bloodshed reached a 34-year-old militia captain named Benedict Arnold, he closed his shop in New Haven, Connecticut, and headed to the rebel camp at Cambridge. Benedict Arnold, as a civilian, had followed a number of different occupations, and that kind of is reflective of the fact that the man was probably a driven type A personality who just couldn't sit still. So he was uh, at one point an apothecary, at another point he was a ship captain, at another point he was a merchant. A uh, very busy guy, very high energy levels. Outside Boston, Arnold found the newborn American army laying siege with no siege weapons. He knew that on Lake Champlain, on the New York frontier, the British had more than a hundred cannons at a fortress called Ticonderoga. Arnold set off to recruit men to attack it. He soon learned that others were already on their way. The brawling woodsmen who called themselves the Green Mountain Boys, led by a rum-swilling giant of a man named Ethan Allen. Allen and Arnold agreed to attack Ticonderoga together. At dawn on May 10th, 83 Americans crept toward the fort. They found the gate open. Only one sentry was on duty, and he was asleep. When he awoke, his musket wouldn't fire, and he ran away. Outside the officers' quarters, Ethan Allen yelled, Come out, you old rat! In ten minutes, without a shot fired, Allen demanded surrender of the greatest fortress in America from a half-dressed British officer still holding his trousers. The British, I think, above all, felt humiliated by the loss of Ticonderoga. They had taken... Uh, this great fortress from the French at enormous cost in the Seven Years' War. And here, in 1775, was a band of what one British officer called ragamuffins seizing this strategic post uh, from its British garrison. It did come as a considerable blow to British pride. Eight days after the capture of Ticonderoga, news of the victory reached the rebel leaders in Philadelphia. But the Continental Congress was more alarmed than elated by this overt act of aggression. It immediately ordered all the captured guns inventoried for return to the British as soon as hostilities had cooled down. Despite the bloodshed at Lexington and Concord, the men in Congress, like most colonists, hesitated to go to war against England. They still hoped for reconciliation. Tears stand in my eyes when I think of this once happy land of liberty. All is anarchy and confusion. We are all in arms. May God put a speedy and happy end to this contest between the mother and her children. Two days after Lexington, 20,000 rebels surrounded Boston. Trapped in the city with the Redcoats were thousands of Americans still loyal to the King of England. 
The British Commander-in-Chief, General Gage, had asked London for 20,000 more troops to suppress the insurrection. London granted 2,000. And three generals, Henry Clinton, William Howe, and John Burgoyne. The rebel press noted that the ship carrying the generals to the colonies was called the Cerberus, after the mythical three-headed dog that guarded the gates of hell. The British generals planned to attack the Americans and break the deadlock at Boston. But within 24 hours, rebel spies reported the British strategy to the Americans. The Americans decided to move first and occupy the Charlestown Peninsula. Their plan was to build fortifications above Boston Harbor, the lifeline for British supplies. The place they chose was called Bunker Hill. The man they chose to lead them was Massachusetts Colonel William Prescott. On the evening of June 16th, Prescott and more than a thousand men moved out to fortify Bunker Hill. Instead, in the confusion of darkness, the rebels chose a lower site called Breed's Hill. The Americans labored all night on their defenses. At first light, a watchman aboard a British warship was shocked to discover that the face of Breed's Hill was crowned by a 136-foot-long entrenchment. General Clinton proposed landing two forces on the Charlestown Peninsula and trapping the Americans between them. Surprisingly, General Gage overruled him and prepared for a more perilous move, a frontal assault. The decision of the British to actually storm the American defenses on Bunker's Hill, or Breed's Hill, as it was, may seem now rather odd, but the reason they did it, I think, was primarily psychological. The British had suffered an embarrassing, humiliating uh, reverse uh, on the day of Lexington and Concord. So they had to reassert the superiority of regular troops over the colonial militia. Gage's strategy required waiting six hours for high tide, six more hours for the Americans to fortify Breed's Hill. At the rebel redoubt, an elegantly dressed patriot arrived, carrying a borrowed musket on his arm and a book of poetry in his pocket. Joseph Warren was one of the colony's most successful physicians, and the leader of the Boston rebels. At dinner the evening before, he had confided to companions that he had foreseen his death on this hill, but he had no intention of ducking the fray. These fellows say we won't fight. By heaven, I hope I shall die up to my knees in British blood. By two o'clock, the British had landed 2,500 troops. By three o'clock, they were ready. Along with much of Boston, General Burgoyne watched the assault on Breed's Hill. Now ensued one of the greatest scenes of war that can be conceived. Howe's troops ascending the hill. The roar of cannon, mortars, and musketry made the whole a picture of horror beyond anything that ever came to my lot to be witness to. The Redcoat charge collapsed. Officers in particular were singled out. They have appalling officer casualties. It's 
stuff that scares the dickens out of the British command structure because they have not experienced death rates and wound, serious wound rates among the officer corps like that in a comparable engagement in their living memory. Bringing up reinforcements, Howe ordered a second attack. And then a third. By now, the rebels were nearly out of powder. In the last charge, some had even fired broken glass, rocks, and nails in place of musket balls. Prescott's men waited until the Redcoats were again in range and spent their last precious rounds. Major Pitcairn, who had led the Redcoats onto Lexington Green just two months earlier, went down with four shots in him and died in the arms of his son. Defenseless now against British bayonets, Prescott finally ordered his men to retreat. The dead and wounded lay on every side of us. Their groans were piercing. Our orders were to make the best retreat we could. We set off almost gone with fatigue leaving some of our dead in the field. Among those left in the field was the Patriot leader who had foreseen his own death, Joseph Warren. A British officer on burial detail wrote, Dr. Warren I found among the slain, and stuffed the scoundrel with another rebel into one hole. And there he and his seditious principles may remain. Buying time for his comrades to retreat, Joseph Warren had been shot in the back of the head. He was 34 years old. I have just heard that our dear friend, Dr. Warren, fell gloriously fighting for his country. Great is our loss. Almighty God, cover the heads of our countrymen. May we be supported and sustained in the dreadful conflict. I cannot compose myself to write any further. Abigail Adams. By day's end, the British had won the field, but at a terrible price. Their casualty rate, over 40%, was the highest the British would suffer in the entire revolution. A thousand men were killed or wounded. General Clinton said it was a dear-bought victory. Another such would have ruined us. The Americans lost the hill, but they won a newfound confidence. What they lacked was training, a treasury, and a leader. While still hoping to restore peace, Congress prepared for war. It proclaimed the jumble of militia companies besieging Boston the American Continental Army. Paying for the army was another matter. Congress had no power to levy taxes. So it simply invented a currency and issued two million new notes called Continental Dollars. They were designed and engraved by silversmith Paul Revere. Congress also had to choose a man to lead the new army. The commander of the militia, Artemis Ward, had never led troops in battle and was thought too timid. At 57, the veteran Connecticut Colonel Israel Putnam was thought too old. The most experienced officer, a former English Colonel named Charles Lee, was just too British. Samuel Adams' influential cousin John wanted a man from the South, someone who could bring the other colonies into New England's war. What they all wanted was a man they could trust with the terrible power of an army. 
On June 14th, Adams began to glowingly describe his candidate. A gentleman from Virginia who is among us here and very well known to all of us. A gentleman with skill and experience as an officer, independent fortune, great talents, and excellent universal character. Colonel George Washington of Virginia had arrived each day at Congress conspicuously clad in the red and blue uniform he had worn in the French and Indian War. At the end of that war, Washington had campaigned for an officer's commission in the British Army. The British turned him down. Now, Washington was campaigning once again. George Washington was a very unlikely choice. There weren't a lot of other choices. The Americans didn't have a very strong military tradition separate from the British. You know, it was a society that was a part of the British Empire. I think uh, George Washington uh, maybe wasn't the greatest military figure in the world or the greatest man for the job at the time. But I think the greatness of the man was his ability to sort of promote himself as the best man for the job at a time when they needed somebody to do that. They were all uh, brand new to the game. They didn't know where they were going. He had the great moxie you know, to show up at the Continental Congress and be his own PR. He said, I'm here. I can do the job. Congress voted unanimously to name Washington Commander-in-Chief. The 43-year-old Virginian had commanded troops in only two battles. One of them started the French and Indian War. The other, he lost. Looking back at it a couple centuries later, it was a great choice. But uh, at the time, I mean, it was a crapshoot. When Washington left Philadelphia to join his army, he wrote a soldier's farewell to his wife, Martha. I go fully trusting in that providence which has been more bountiful to me than I deserved. I retain an unalterable affection for you, which neither time nor distance can change. He assured her he'd return by Christmas, and he would, eight years later. Washington would be facing the finest army in the world. The British regulars had served an average 10 years, while the American militia was mostly untrained. But a New York newspaper noted a rebel advantage. It must be considered that there is a very material difference between a man who fights for his natural liberty and the man who only fights because he is paid. The British did possess a thousand times the wealth of the colonists, who could barely manufacture weapons or gunpowder. The American Navy consisted of eight small vessels against 270 British warships. The world would be watching to see if the insolent Yankees could vanquish the professional Redcoats. To see if the American David could stand against the British Goliath. You've been given all the information. Now it's your turn to discuss the questions. Take a moment to talk about the following. How did George Washington's leadership help the colonists win the Revolutionary War? How were the rebel tactics different from what the British had faced before? We hope you've enjoyed this assignment discovery journey into American history, Road to Revolution. If you'd like to learn more about what you've just seen, go online or check out these books at your local library. <laughs>